Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I wanted to start this talk making a special thanks to the Deputy Ministry for Vocational Training of the Basque Government for having invited me to this event. The other day, we held an event at the university. You may know that I work at the university here. And the Secretary General of Confi Basque, which is the Basque Employers Association, told us off. They told us off for several things. One of the reasons they told us off, and they were right about it, was they said, OK, yeah, we've got some good universities here. We need to get universities and vocational training centers and technology parks to all collaborate a little bit more together. We need to be closer to each other. And the people that work in all these organizations need to be closer to each other, need to have closer ties. And they're right, because there are times when we meet up. But I think we actually ought to meet up a bit more often and have a deeper relationship. And that's why I'm so pleased that you've invited me here to talk at an event on vocational training. And you've asked me to come and give a talk. This is the talk that I always give. So if you've seen me before, I've only got one talk to give. I always give the same old talk. I'm just telling you. So if you ever heard me before, sorry, you know what I'm going to say. And I always talk about three things that are the three priorities that I think all advanced nations should have on the table uh, before us, which is industry, knowledge and people. And in fact, what we heard from the introductory words, this, these three subjects came up quite a lot, because this is really the essence of everything that we're doing, because vocational training is linked to industry, to knowledge or skills, and above all, it's of course linked to people. There's a, a story that I'm going to use to give you this talk, which is the story of Alice in Wonderland. I don't know if you've heard Alice in Wonderland. This is a film that Tim Burton uh, made recently, and he actually mixed their Alice in Through the Looking Glass with Alice in Wonderland. And this whole thing starts out with Alice falling into a rabbit warren. And he, she tries to follow a very busy rabbit down the warren and she ends up falling into his warren, which is actually what we've done here in Europe over the last five years. We've sort of fallen down a black hole. I don't know if you remember, I don't know if you know, the first part of this graph goes down a little bit, that might be, that was Lehman Brothers. If it had been Lehman Brothers and Sisters, things wouldn't have been so bad. But actually, this just goes to show. This is a lesson we need to learn, actually. Lehman Brothers and Sisters a lot better. Then you remember the green shoes? You remember all about the green shoes? Well, that's in green there. And then we've spent a further two long years falling down this black hole. Seems like we're getting out of this black hole now. And this is, uh, by the way, this is an in a chart that we form by asking people that are in charge of um, purchasing in companies. And we're seeing that throughout Europe, industry is on the increase, industrial activity is on the up. But ha however, after the sort of failure of all these green shoots programs, we're all a bit cautious. We don't know whether this is all going to progress as it should. And we're cautious because the world is changing an awful lot. This is a photo of what the world looks now. 7 billion inhabitants. And this is more or less how it's divided up. You've got a billion living in the Americas, a billion living in Europe and the European area of Russia. There are about a billion living in Africa and there are 4 billion living in Asia. That's what it looks like today. But actually more interesting than this photo is the left-hand side of the screen where you can see what's happened over the last 50 or so years. And we, it sort of crept up on us, this phenomena, a very surprising phenomena in mankind's history, which is that for several centuries, the, the pyramid, the populational pyramid, had, had broadened. Every year, more children were being born than the previous year. And these children were surviving, so the world population was on the up. And what's happened over the last 10 years Whilst, whilst my children were growing up, has been that there are no longer more children on the face of the earth every year. The 
population of children has actually gradually stabilized, which means that there's not going to be a great deal more growth. Throughout the whole of this century, the world population actually is going to grow in number because of an aging population. Because what's happening... Well, by the way, I was born in 1965, and in this graph you can see the birth rates of different countries and, and life expectancy as well. And here you can see how there was a group of countries which are the ones on the left at the top. These are those so-called advanced countries in which we lived for longer and the birth rate had gone down. Families had fewer children. There were still large families. I've got four. We're four brothers and sisters, and that was kind of normal in my era to have a big family. But the number of children per woman at that time, on average, in advanced uh, countries was around two to three children per woman. However, in developing nations, which is what's on the right-hand side of this graph, you can see a bright blue blob. That's China. There's an another one that's Brazil. But these blobs that you can see to the right of the screen are countries that have all s lots of children per family. But let's see how this changes between 1965 and 2012. These are the data from 2012. And you can see where uh, how things have changed as far as life expectancy and children per women go. All of the countries in the whole of the world have all gone to the left where developed countries used to be. Yellow represents Africa. I heard on the radio today that there's some people from Africa here today. Yesterday, in fact, in Deuster, together with the George Washington University, we organised an event on how Africa is going to be changing over the next decade and how it's going to move even further left. And the remainder of this decade and the next decade, Africa is also going to move to the left of this screen. And that's because... Uh, Children aren't have women aren't having more than two women per children hardly reaches two, so that means that by the end of the century there are people that say we're going to be around eleven billion on this planet. It's going to be more or less like that. We know that we're going to be living longer, and so we know that the pyramid will get a little bit wider at the top, the world population's pyramid. But the base of the pyramid's no good longer going to get any bigger. There's going to be eleven billion people on the planet. Uh, the world population will have stabilised. But look at the way it's distributed. In America, there'll still be a billion people. In Europe, there'll still be a billion people. Asia will go from four to five billion. And Africa, from a billion that they have now, will have four billion. These are, of course, demographic trends, but they're very stable. And the chances are there's not much uh, error margin in them. So that's the, what the world's going to look like in the year uh, 2100. You know that there's a massive fence in Melilla to stop people getting into Spain from Africa, but you're not going to stop them. Something else is going to happen. There's going to be a consolidation of middle classes, something that this is happening in many, many countries. And uh, per capita income is going up as well. This is what the photo looked like in 1970. At that time, I don't know if you remember, there was a program on the television called 35 Million Spaniards, which was the population of Spain. And this is the photo in 1970 of the world's wealth. A lot of people in 1970 lived below the poverty threshold. Those countries on the left of this graph lived with uh, less than a dollar a day, which is uh, considered at the extreme poverty threshold. But in very few years, look how things have evolved between 1970 and 2000. This camel that used to have two humps has now become a dromedary. It's got one hump. And what you're seeing is this move, this shift. Um, middle classes are becoming more and more consolidated. And the middle class have traditionally driven world economy throughout the whole of this century. There's a graph prepared by Gapmind every year. And what you find on the horizontal axis are, is income per person and on the vertical, life expectancy, average life expectancy. And there you can see a clear correlation. The more wealthy we are, 
the more uh, life expectancy we have, the better our healthcare systems. And then in the central part of this graph, you've got what are considered the middle classes. And once again, you can see how uh, in the left, Africa, which is the continent in blue, is what needs to be uh, to come on board in the middle classes. But Latin America. Um, and much, uh, many parts of Asia have really joined the middle classes. Look at the size of India's population, the size of China's population. These are where what we used to call the advanced uh, nations are. Here you've got the example of US. The US is in a very wealthy country, but life expectancy isn't as high as other countries. And um, the uh, American administration is trying to improve that situation, is trying to improve the health system because the way the health system works in the US is such that only those that have money can actually access it, they can access good health care. And here you can see uh, the wealthy countries. Can you just see Liechtenstein there? When you actually uh, retire and you've got lots of money you need to go live in Monaco because actually look at Monaco it's from the top right hand point of this screen because that's where they live longest and apparently they live and they eventually die because they're just so bored of, of living that's unfortunately the situation in Monaco I don't know if there's anybody in Monaco from Monaco in the room but if they are I've really put my foot in it so the message that I'm trying to get across is the following. In these countries, middle classes are consolidating. This is a fantastic news for mankind because in 2030, there'll be 8 billion people and almost 5 billion will be considered the middle class. And the middle class will be found throughout all the continents of this world. In Asia, we will have uh, 3.2 billion people consuming 3.2 billion people that want their washing machine, their TV, their car, and the uh, training for their kids. And in Europe, and we'll be number two, and the United States will have 320 million. This is the snapshot of the demand that we'll see in the future. And that's why right now we are seeing this interest from all the countries to generate an industry that is able to cover those needs. This uh, path where we had the developed countries are lagging behind between 2010 and 2020. There's no doubt that China will overtake um, United States in uh, wealth uh, production, wealth production. Uh, Russia will overtake uh, Germany. So we're going to see major changes in the future. And this is what makes us feel in the developed countries. And you come from many different countries. So I work, I have this uh, European uh, view, but this is also happening in Japan that we're going through this rabbit warren. We are experiencing one other thing. And it's been mentioned already that at a demographic level, we face a serious problem. This is the pyramid that we are, have in the Basque country of 2014. We more or less know what we'll, what we'll look like in 2025 following the trends, which are very stable. And we know that it will change very slowly. And we have a problem, a clear problem is not that the belly is going to go move to the chest. Basically, is that we're going to f uh, get less and less uh, young people and th we're going to find some consequences to this. In the, in the uh, left graph, we've uh, I've tried to put the public uh, level or system, which is efficient, and the pensions, people that have uh, quit working and then uh, uh, receiving their pensions. On the green area, it corresponds to the people that are active and working for private companies. Well, not means that they're not working, but it means that they're active, so to speak, that could be working. So we would have to subtract those that are unemployed, that we've said that is 15.5% in the Basque country. When we project this to the future and we'll try to figure out how it would look like in the future in 2025, if 
this population we even projected further to 2045 and the people that would be ready or uh, available to work you see how the images ch the image changes especially um, people that have uh, retired for example me for example, my father is um, 80 years old from 1934 and he would be on that spot whereas me I would be in that spot. I would be there, a bit more to the left. And this is it's what we say in Spain, that children are going to go through a generation which is worse than what their parents have gone through. We still have 40 years to become the first generation that will live worse because I look at my father and I say, well, he's to serve it and he's good at, has a good retirement. And when I, I, I just try to wonder where we're going to get the money from when we uh, grow older. So that's why whenever we focus on the green um, area in 2045, we need to make this green area very productive. We need to make it very competitive and able to generate lots of value because this is where everything is at stake. Uh, and many people are writing and thinking about this and it was uh, maybe we need to uh, carry out deep economical uh, economic changes and capitalism has worked fine for many years and it has many defects and flaws but there's been no other system to generate as much uh, wealth maybe it's very poorly distributed but what's true is that it generates wealth what happens is that this capitalism that we've uh, brought about all the uh, capitalist countries is taken to its limits and we're going through these things that I'm talking about so we keep on doing things and in the same manner we are not going on the right path we need to change the thing is that we don't know who's going to take over which system is going to take over I've uh, mentioned Michael Expense some um, Nobel Prize winners um, Krugman who uh, is all talks a lot and writes a lot about this and there's a young woman who talks about the circular theory and then he's, she's presented this at the Davos forum and she talked about uh, big transformation and then we have Piketty and he has uh, written about, uh, about this book called uh, Capital talking about the inequality problem and all the Nobel Prizes don't wear a tie so maybe I'm making a mistake by wearing a tie in these books, we see the reflections upon the major changes. There are other people that they say, well, we know there's going to be a major uh, transformation. What are we going to do in the next 10 years in order to, um, to ensure prosperity in the uh, United States? And in, we find Gary Pisano, who is a professor at Harvard, MIT, people, some uh, Obama advisors. And then top uh, right bottom, we see a picture of Machucato. And she is from the University of um, Sussex in the United Kingdom. So prosperity requires to be able to create industry. The industry that we have to uh, needs to be needs to be competitive and needs to go ahead. And going ahead means to incorporate latest knowledge, and from that making it into a industrial activity. There is a a, um, a race, so to speak, and countries are, com are competing in this race. So and um, countries are are trying to to make this happen, and this is one of the books that I quoted earlier on. This is from Mike Expense, and he has wrote a book about uh, the un unavoidable convergence, where we have turtle and uh, the turtles and the um, rabbit, and we are going slow, and the emerging countries are the rabbit. So he says that we have to get used to growing slowly, and we have to adapt a wealth, a welfare system. We design it very uh, quickly, and now we have to just get accustomed to the fact that we're going to grow slowly. Others are going to grow quicker. We have created a public system, a welfare system, that wasn't uh, well-dimensioned, so to speak, and we need to 
uh, adapted, we're talking about about authority, and and it's a forbidden word, so to speak, and we get angry because austerity is done in a very uh, unfair way. So we cannot carry on paying a welfare state that uh, instead of uh, we were uh, we were putting the invoices to we were making our children pay for it, so to speak. We've done that in a very unfair manner, especially making other people uh, or other classes pay for it. So we need to adapt and it's taking some efforts, but it's unavoidable. And then the second part of the this adjustment, it requires a lot of attention and it can uh, take us back to the growth path. We need to invest more in uh, technology by creating uh, advanced manufacturing uh, processes. This is when uh, Alice stops falling and she is in a room with a big a little door uh, with a key she needs to eat in order to grow, to pick up the key and needs to drink and to shrink in order to go through the door. This is uh, some uh, this is what we need to be. We need to be global. There's no other way. And at the same time, we need to have roots. We need to be rooted somewhere. And globally, if uh, if globalization makes us lose attention to our settings or to our environment, and if we don't um, if we don't do this, we're going to lose the race. I think the United States is paying a lot of attention. At the speech of Barack Obama, which was held in January 2014. He said that we right now have the opportunity to win vis-à-vis -vis other countries regarding uh, advanced manufacturing. We have uh, launched two centers in Raleigh and Youngstown, and we're going to launch six other centers in advanced manufacturing. And he continues saying that the nation that puts its stakes in innovation will be the owner of world economy, something that we cannot give up on. This is... Uh, United States and Accenture, uh, it's a big uh, multinational company that contracts uh, many people, uh, many um, graduates, and they carry out a survey. And they did this with Manufacturing Institute. They do a um, survey to companies, and basically they ask them, if they have any issue when finding skilled workers, and they're not referring only to university or degrees, but also to vocational training. And this uh, study has been published in May and it's available in the internet. And the conclusions are terrifying because over 75% of industries in the United States, over 75% have problems or find it difficult or moderate or serious problems to find uh, specialized profiles that they need, over 75%. So when we said at the beginning that in the um, following years, we will there be a generation changeover, this will affect demand in terms of uh, vocational training um, profiles. So we have a problem. It's 50 percent of uh, American companies are trying to recover production um, sites in the United States, reshoring. Over 75 percent of companies say that they have problems to find a skilled people. And this is, as a consequence, they having 11 percent of losses in terms of production. This is a bit a summary of what's happening in the United States. So what's the United States doing about it? They These are headlines from January. and. We see that they're determined. If you want to recover your industry, you have to put your stakes on your vocational training. This is a very important pillar. What about Germany? And it's been um, quoted. Um, well, he's a she's a bit thin because of austerity. This is our friend Merkel. Maybe I get some. I get told off by Germans here. No, we we have a lot of. Um, we like Germans. Don't worry. And Angela was invited by the um, OECD, uh, she went to Paris, and what she said, so why Germany is doing better than other European countries? Well, we uh, 
we devote around 3% of our GDP to research and development or new knowledge. She talked about 4.0 industry. And at the end of the day, we manufacture very well. People are very skilled in manufacturing our processes. But these people, if we don't make these people integrate the digital side, the redistribution of the value chain and using the new tools that is offered on the internet, our engineers will have no value, so to speak. This is what Angela Merkel said a couple of months ago. And this is what explains the race among countries. And this graph, um, we see how devoted each country is towards uh, knowledge, how much money you're actually putting into R plus D. We've seen this in Germany, the United States. France is around 2%, a bit over 2%, and the UK is a bit under that, um, or below that. And then this graph tells us how much they're investing and how much they're putting the stakes on it. And in the next slide, we're going to see what the industrial evolution has been throughout the uh, last 14 years. And then we have Germany and the United States on the top. This is from 2000 to 2014. We see that there are countries that have a bigger industry than in 2000. And there are five other countries, France, UK, Italy, Spain and Greece, that have less industry. We've lost industry, so to speak. If you look at the order, uh, Germany, United States, France, etc., and you, if you see the ability to create um, industrial activity, so they're very much intertwined and linked. We have to take into account labor costs, um, energy costs, and the situation. So we need to incorporate added value industry. So thanks to these uh, works, uh, Germany has an unemployment level of 5.1% and the uh, United States 6.7%. So it's a safe bet, so to speak. This is a map that is played by Battel, which tells us a bit about the race towards knowledge. The more to the right, the countries have gone more for technology and innovation. And there's a correlation between what you invest and the number of uh, skilled workers that work on those fields. In terms of the bubble size, um, this is the absolute um, dimension. If you are more to the right, that is that you invest more proportionally. But um, to uh, United States is bigger because it's a bigger size. This was the situation in 2004. But now I'm going to show you the situation, how it will look like in 2014. If you look at this um, graph, the three red bubbles where we find Germany, uh, United Kingdom and France, if you look at the difference between 2014, Germany has had the group, in spite of the crisis they've gone through, they've uh, worked with a lot of determination and followed by France and the UK. But if you look at China, in 2004, was a medium-sized bubble and how is moving towards the right and how is getting bigger and bigger. The plan or what schedule is to converge with the United States, but also in science and technology. That's the global race that we are living. And this is a map um, drafted by the European Commission that shows not only what countries are invested in science and technology, but how is turn or converted in patents and high technology products, high tech products. The uh, dark color it shows the innovation leaders countries because they are investing a lot of money and they are knowing how to get take advantage of that investment. The uh, light green color are, are leading after and then Paris you can see that that um, is actually absorbing all the energy from the surrounding countries. And in Spain, only Navarre and the Basque country are uh, light green. Well, the thing is, in Spain is, well, we're not doing so bad. It depends who you compare to. And the problem is, who do we compete with? And the uh, art industries compete against um, 
uh, in Europe. So to become innovators is the things that we have to um, compete with very innovative countries. And Germany has distributed this um, in terms of areas. Not only he it invests in this, but it uh, thinks what the companies want to, basically. If they need something, they'll invest in that. So the knowledge uh, system has a part of basic um, research and uh, companies have no criteria, but we need that criteria because this is where we see in the major breakthroughs in terms of knowledge. In Germany, they have in uh, March Planck institutes, uh, in academies, in research centers, and then we have technological centers that need to be need to bridge between companies and basic research. And then on the right, we find research linked to company. We have vocational training centers in Germany where they make these centers very close to companies. So knowledge goes very quickly into the uh, business sector. So when you are investing 3% of your GDP in uh, innovation and technology, this is what happens. This is another image with the volume of the amounts that is being investing. And this is a graph from the Eurostat unemployment rate and the, the countries, how they are investing in innovation and how it's been reflected in unemployment. Before, I talked about a United States unemployment rates, etc., but it's not sheer coincidence. If you look at the European countries and you look how they dedicate their funds and you look at the unemployment rates, those countries like Sweden, Dan Denmark, uh, Germany, and countries that are famous for having a very good vocational training because when you put your stakes on it, you, put, you give added value to all the chain, to the value chain. These are the three keys that will allow us to go for prosperity, put our stakes in industry and science technology and knowledge and to put our stakes on people because people are the only one, people are the only capable of, of turning things around. The white king, when she finds uh, Alice, she could uh, see the future and she, the white uh, queen ask uh, Alice to think of six impossible things, impossible things uh, at breakfast. So when we face this situation, people say, well, we can't turn things around. How are we going to take into account the crisis, cutbacks, and taking into account uh, issues in the industry and bearing in mind uh, social problems? How are we going to go this way? How are we going to flip it over? And I'm talking about the vast country, but I'm sure that in many countries where you work, you're probably facing to the same challenges. The thing, the thing is, is when we're talking about impossible things, this is a graph that um, shows the percentage reflected on the uh, gross added value in the 28 member states. We've set a goal, the 2020 goal, and we are achieving, uh, aiming at 20%. And if you look at the graph, and if you look at the goal, we already set the goal of 3% on GDP on R plus D. We set it for 2010. We've uh, postponed it to 2020. If you look at the graph and you look where you have to go, it's, a, it's completely impossible. We're not going to make it. We need to fight for it. We need to fight against this idea that it's impossible. Impossible is nothing. It's necessary. Either we do that and the same applies when we talk about VET, when we set a goal. If I've got these slides from the Confebas uh, secretary and I saw the slides and I found them very interesting. That's why I'm sharing it with you, sharing these with you. If we want to put our stakes in 
research and uh, and excellence and industry, we need to have a very good VET uh, sector. Those who uh, build up industry are uh, skilled workers have been trained in very uh, high quality centers. And the needs are going to be very different and somehow larger. So the goal that has been set by the European Commission by 20, uh, 2020 is to have 35% uh, of graduates, 50% of vocational training um, students, and 15% under that level. In one of the surveys carried out by Accenture, I was talking about and um, asking graduates whether the work they carried out was in line with their studies, 46% of graduates um, state that are working in things that they they needn't have their uh, the studies, so to speak, so they, this has grown 5%. So there's a decoupling, so to speak, in terms of what you study and what you end up doing. And many people uh, uh, go to the university and at the end they don't get the necessary skills for the market. So we need to improve this. This is the situation right now in the Basque country, which is not bad, but we have a, a very important challenge. Jorge. Um, depending on uh, said that depending on how you interpret this, we would need to change. But I'm sure that in uh, his speech he will cover this. But um, we need to make a very important um, effort to correct this and to put our stakes on vocational training. How are we going to do this, ladies and gentlemen? And this is my just to, to finish. We need to think in impossible things. We need to set impossible goals, so to speak, or very ambitious goals. When we put, when we say that we have to put our stakes in industry, we really need to do it. Not only by words, but by budgets. Not only by holding speeches, but also being uh, consistent and putting our stakes in vocational training. And this is what we are doing here. This is a show. This shows our commitment to identify best practices, to bring. Uh, people uh, from abroad that are working in who are working in uh, vocational training and sharing best practices and it's important to put our stakes in um, knowledge infrastructures we need to invest in R plus D and this investment needs to be uh, directed towards uh, VEP centers you need to be identified as a key role player in the chain. I was with the Singapore uh, VET responsible. Uh, we In Singapore, we want to go to uh, Made in Euskadi to Thought in Euskadi. And he replied, well, this is very good, but I think it's not correct. If you forget on how you do things, it will you will end up that you're only going to be you'll be focused on thinking and you cannot think because you need to think together with industry in terms of how you do things. There's a lot of uh, knowledge that's generated among uh, workers that have been uh, trained in VET. I've worked um, hand in hand with VET. I had I was graduate, and they were far better than I was. They understood processes much better. They understood how they improve their processes. They thrashed me in at all levels, and they knew what other other countries were doing as well. And they were do, they were they were doing all this on on vocational grounds because they like this and we need to follow this path, this um, knowledge, for instance, you have, we have to be determined. It's a bit, this message is a bit uncomfortable because um, if you look at the options that we need to take in terms of the adjustment, this is long-term um, works. And at short term, uh, society has many needs and we need to tell the society very clearly that we need to take a sacrifice, sacrifice. We need to work for our children and we need to have long-term um, determinations. 
we actually it's the future of our country is at stake and we it's very clear for us to convey this message very very it's necessary to convey this message and we not give up on this and i think this is correct but we need to set or draw another red line to defend industry and knowledge and we need to um ingrain this and we need to put our stakes on people as I was driving here, I was listening to the interview to the manager of Confibas and she talked about vocational training, talked about um, senior people and all oh, those that are over 45 that are a bit outside our scope of universities and that are going very uh, difficult uh, situation as the regional minister said and there's a group of people that is a bit lagging behind and the only way of bringing them back is by training and universities and technical colleges will need to collaborate in order to offer means so that these people can come back and we cannot create a group of people that for the next 10 or 15 years will be uh, decoupled and the uh, comfort pass manager said uh, women is inclusion is very important as well Jose Ignacio said well uh, um, we were all men uh, in the past this we need to flip this over we are uh, actually we remember what happened in lemon brothers what they messed up so if we are only men work we're going to have the same mess we need women and there are many countries that are launching programs to foster uh, equal participation in terms of maths technology and industry we need to mimic this it's very important and I am I am a dean of a business school. We need to correct and we need to learn to collaborate. So thank you very much for inviting me. I hope you didn't get very bored with my presentation. And uh, thank you very much for your attention.